Welcome back. We're here for our final lecture of going out on a limb, the anatomy of the upper limb. And we're going to be turning our attention now to a different side of embryology, those being the extrinsic causes of limb deformation. So these are things from outside of the developing fetus that are causing problems with development uh, or formation of the upper limb. So, first of all, let's just compare and contrast what we talked about last lecture with this lecture. And these are different types of disruptions of the upper limb. Intrinsic disruptions of the upper limb generally are, as we said before, due to internal problems with the formation or development or maintenance of that body part. Often they may be due to genetic syndromes or be part of just a larger constellation of findings uh, that, again, are caused by something within the organism, within the fetus itself. Whereas extrinsic disruptions are generally caused by in utero factors, things that occur while the child is developing in the uterus that could cause either physical or chemical de uh, damage to that body part before it's fully developed. Some of the common causes for intrinsic findings, as we said, may be genetic syndromes. It could be problems with tissue migration. Remember, uh, those somites are going to be forming the tissues that form ultimately the mesenchyme, the soft tissues, bones, blood vessels uh, of the upper limb. And they have to migrate to get there. They have to go from essentially the spine or the area of the spine to the upper limb. So if there are problems with that migration, that could also certainly result in limb uh, malformations or they could be what we call idiopathic. Idiopathic is a general word in medicine that means we're not really sure what the cause is. We know that there's a problem. We may be able to do something about it, although we may not necessarily, but we don't necessarily know what the cause is as well. Idiopathic means we're not sure what the cause is. Extrinsic disruptions uh, may also be idiopathic, but we do certainly know some common causes. Often viruses or bacteria can cause a disruption, uh, especially if there's exposure early in development in the uterus. Uh, drugs, we already mentioned one of those actually. Thalidomide is an example of a drug that did cause uh, uh, disruptions in limb development. Uh, toxins or toxin exposure, as well as just a harsh environment for the developing fetus, having a low volume of amniotic fluid. Remember, amniotic fluid is there essentially to cushion the developing child, to maintain a relatively constant temperature, to avoid shock to the developing child. So having a low amniotic fluid volume, which could result in a high temperature, or just being uh, exposed to high temperature in general, can also cause these disruptions. Uh, intrinsic disruptions often will have other associated abnormalities in pathology, as we saw. With absent radius, for example, we saw thrombocyte, uh, thrombocytopenia and absent radius syndrome, holt orum syndrome. Um, those are things that are associated with that one particular anatomic abnormality. And for extrinsic disruptions, those also can have other associated abnormalities in pathology. The same toxins that may cause problems with limb development may also cause problems with development of other organs and organ systems. For intrinsic disruptions, generally they're not preventable. We may know of a genetic syndrome that runs in a particular family, and that may be something that we could screen for as the child is developing through either chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis. Um, but often, even if we do find that, there's really not much that we can do. If somebody uh, is developing with a particular genetic syndrome, unfortunately we're not yet at a point where we can generally cure that uh, before the child is born. Whereas for extrinsic disruptions, sometimes they may not be preventable, but often they are. Um, this may be a public health outreach to avoid having uh, a mother who, say, is addicted to an illicit drug, uh, using that drug during pregnancy. Uh, this may be taking patients off of medications during pregnancy. This may be additional screening so that if a patient does have low amniotic fluid volume, uh, that we're able to do what we can to uh, essentially protect that developing child. And the last thing is, I should be careful with the terminology here. Intrinsic disruptions we generally call malformations, whereas extrinsic disruptions we call deformations. A malformation essentially is that it formed incorrectly. A deformation is that something from outside has gone in uh, or has caused damage to that developing limb. So let's take a look at some of those causes uh, of extrinsic uh, deformations here. So viruses and bacteria can play a major role. Varicella zoster, which is the chickenpox virus, for example, can cause uh, underdevelopment of the digits or the limb. 
And you see, for example, here that we have an undeveloped thumb uh, on this particular uh, example, and this is caused in this particular case, uh, again, by exposure to the varicella zoster chickenpox virus while the child was in utero. Now, does that mean that chickenpox itself is getting into the uterus directly from the outside world? No, it's that the mother has been exposed here. The mother has gotten varicella zoster, and then the virus itself can cross the placenta, but it's crossing from within here, from essentially the mother's blood supply crossing the placenta to get to the developing child's blood supply. Um, and you see here, actually, it could certainly be even more dramatic. Uh, this is a much more significant limb under development, uh, particularly of the most distal structures, the, uh, the distal forearm, the wrist, and the hand. Uh, other examples could be syphilis. Syphilis is a very common bacteria throughout the uh, general population, particularly in uh, urban environments. It is a sexually transmitted disease. Um, and syphilis, uh, if there is exposure in utero from either a mother who gets exposed to syphilis while pregnant or who has just undiagnosed syphilis that can, again, cross the, uh, cross the placenta, that can lead to lesions of the humerus. Uh, you see in this particular example, the humerus at its most uh, proximal end or almost mid-shaft, I should say, does have some swelling, some bony deformities, but there can also be other findings elsewhere. So just to mention some of those, I mentioned Hutchinson teeth. Hutchinson teeth you see right here, it's some of these extra notches that you see primarily in those uh, most anterior teeth, those central incisors. Patients can also have what are called saber shins. You see this in the lower limb, and you can see actually this forward bowing of the tibia, the main shin bone, uh, that causes a bit of sort of this curvature to the lower limb, sometimes again called that saber shin. Uh, and there can be other abnormalities to the face uh, and structures of the head and neck as well. Uh, in general, to be able to prevent this, uh, we do a lot of screenings during pregnancy. Some of these screenings are the moment that somebody finds out that they're pregnant, the first time that they see their obstetrician gynecologist, they'll be screened for them. Others we may screen for multiple times during the course of pregnancy or right before the actual labor and delivery. So we'll use this particular lecture as a launching off point to talk a little bit about obstetricians uh, or obstetrics and gynecology and a little bit of the screening uh, and testing that we may do during, uh, during a pregnancy itself. So we do generally screen again for varicella zoster, that's the chicken pox virus, although actually as a side note, uh, not only does it cause chicken pox, but this is also the virus that causes shingles. Shingles essentially is a reactivation that usually comes either in later age or if somebody has a period of immunosuppression, uh, then we can get reactivation of this virus causing shingles, a very, very painful uh, disease that essentially causes uh, a strip of skin, what's called a dermatome of the skin, uh, to become red and blistered and, and very uncomfortable. Syphilis, as we mentioned before, is green for other sexually transmitted diseases uh, often will travel together as a group, so gonorrhea and chlamydia, and actually in this particular example you're seeing gonorrhea. You can see that we have these white blood cells here uh, with their what are called multilobated nuclei with those large spots. But you see in some of them are also there are these little red spots, these smaller red spots. That's actually the gonorrhea bacteria sitting uh, within some of those cells right there. HIV also is something that we need to know about because we want to avoid uh, transmission to the child uh, not only in utero but also at the time of birth. Rubella as well, hept uh, hepatitis B and C, and finally group E strep. Now group E strep we actually just screen for at the very end of pregnancy. It's not something that causes significant problems during development, uh, but actually if a child is born and the mother's uh, vagina is colonized with group E strep, the child can get exposed to that group E strep and actually it can cause some very significant pneumonias uh, and meningitis in the neonatal period. So that's something that we generally will uh, test for later in pregnancy before actual labor and delivery. So that's one cause of uh, limb deformations. Let's take a look at some drugs and toxins. <coughs> so we mentioned one before. We talked about thalidomide, and again, that can cause phocomelia. We talked about it in the previous lecture because, again, it can be an intrinsic cause of limb malformation, uh, which could be caused by a genetic syndrome, but also we wanted to use it as an opportunity to really discuss that progress zone model versus the pre-specification model of limb development. Warfarin, uh, which is used often after surgeries, uh, 
is uh, something as well that can cause these significant limb deformations. It can cause shortened fingers, it can cause facial an uh, abnormalities or anomalies as well. Warfarin essentially is an anti-blood clotting agent. Uh, it's going to make it more challenging for blood to clot, uh, and often we'll do that if somebody's going to be immobilized for a period of time, say after a surgery, to help avoid having blood clots form in the vessels of the lower limb. So there's certainly an advantage to be said about warfarin, but taken during pregnancy, again, it can cause some significant birth defects. Phenytoin, which is actually an anti-epileptic or anti-seizure medication, uh, can cause nail and finger hypoplasia. Hypoplasia essentially meaning underdevelopment or not complete development of that particular uh, part of the body. So here you can see very underdeveloped fingernails, uh, and that would be an example of nail hypoplasia. Uh, cocaine also, so illicit drugs, not just prescription drugs, but illicit drugs can of course cause some significant problems in um, in, in infants as they're developing. We can end up with limb reduction, uh, and this limb reduction primarily comes from vascular damage. Cocaine likes to cause essentially clamping down of vessels. This is also why many people, uh, if taking a cocaine overdose, may have a heart attack, because the vessels that feed the heart, the coronary arteries, can close down in the process and make it so the heart's not getting enough oxygen itself. Here, while developing, if those vessels are too small, not getting enough blood supply to the developing limb, then we can end up with limb reduction, either a shortening of the limb or just general smallness of the limb, that the limb itself essentially appears scaled down because it's not been getting enough blood supply. Alcohol as well is well known uh, for causing birth defects. Fetal alcohol syndrome is uh, unfortunately still relatively common in the United States and worldwide. Um, but alcohol, in terms of upper limb findings, actually does not contribute that much. Uh, one small thing that's been noted anecdotally, which is why I have this question mark here, we don't yet have real proof that it's the cause, um, but it may cause some changes in terms of dermatoglyphs. Dermatoglyphs, is our, uh, that's the fancy term for essentially the patterning of the skin folds throughout the body. Most notably, certainly we talk about them for the fingertips, because uh, fingerprinting is certainly something that, uh, that we know from... Uh, its importance in crime and its importance in being able to find uh, essentially people who have done crime. So alcohol can cause some changes in terms of the patterning, uh, although again that's anecdotal evidence. We don't have definitive proof for that. So how do we avoid this? Well, on the one hand, to avoid illicit drugs, we certainly do a urine drug screen uh, for mothers at the beginning of pregnancy and for mothers who we uh, suspect to be higher risk for drug use or who admit to previous drug use, we may screen more commonly or more frequently during pregnancy. Um, but also, the Federal uh, the Food and Drug Association, the, the FDA, uh, does also divide these medications into different pregnancy categories. Now, depending on where you're tuning in from and watching our lectures from, uh, these may or may not apply within your home country. Uh, so certainly, I'm using here the example of the United States, but other countries use different coding systems for pregnancy and for pro uh, possible teratogenicity, possibly causing birth defects. So the FDA has divided these medications into five categories. You can see here category A, uh, essentially showing that studies in humans uh, have not demonstrated a risk, that there have actually been studies and that there, have, uh, that there has not been a risk shown with that particular medication. Category B, you can see, shows that animal studies have not shown risk, uh, but that we have not tested it in humans, so we don't definitively know that it wouldn't cause problems in humans, or that animal studies have shown a risk, but that comparable studies in humans uh, have not shown that risk. So category B, you can see, is saying we suspect that there's not risk, and certainly there may be evidence that there won't be risk, but we don't quite have that strength of evidence that we would have for a category A drug. Category C is showing that animal studies have definitely shown risk, uh, and there are no studies in humans, so we suspect, although we don't have proof, that there would probably be uh, problems with administering that particular medication to a pregnant woman. And category D is showing that human studies uh, have definitely shown risk, so we know that this may cause problems for a developing child, but that there still may be cases that warrant that particular medication's use. And let me give you an example. So a lot of anti-epileptic medications are well known for causing birth defects. We mentioned before phenytoin, um, but valproic acid or Depakote is also well known to cause, in particular, neural tube defects, problems with development, uh, essentially, of the spinal canal. 
But if a woman is seizing multiple times every day, and the only medication that's able to maintain her is a particular regimen of anti-epileptic medications, then in reality the potential risk of that medication may be outweighed by the fact that if this woman is seizing multiple times per day, that clearly is posing a major risk to the developing child uh, as well. So that may be a case where depending on seizure severity, how, frequent they're, uh, how frequently they're occurring, we may give a medication that we know can cause birth defects, but given the rest of the clinical findings and the history of that particular patient, it may be warranted to still be able to protect the developing child as best as possible. Finally, category X. Category X are medications that are absolutely contraindicated uh, or absolutely should not be given in pregnancy. Essentially, studies have shown that there is sufficient risk here to outweigh any potential benefit for that particular drug, so there are no circumstances in which a category X drug should be given to a pregnant woman. Finally, let's take a look at arthrogryposis. Arthrogryposis uh, refers to having curved or hooked joints, and generally it's caused, uh, or, or generally it's found to have these multiple uh, muscle contractures. Muscle contractures essentially being shortened, tightened muscles that have difficulty of relaxing and being lengthened, and therefore it leads to a decreased range of motion. It's harder to actually be able to move the limbs in 3D space with these contracted muscles. There may also be some weakness to the muscles from underdevelopment as well in arthrogryposis. Arthrogryposis is usually caused by external causes. So we mentioned before the uterine environment itself is very important as the child is developing. Having a small uterine volume, which may just be the anatomy uh, of the mother uh, herself, uh, or in reality, besides just being, uh, besides just having a small uterus, she may actually have a uterine anomaly, something like a uterus didelphus, which is actually where the two sides of the uterus don't quite fuse together the right way, and you end up with a reduced volume on the inside. Um, or oligohydramnios, that being the fancy term essentially for having low amniotic fluid uh, within the uterine cavity. In both cases, the volume in which that child is trying to develop is smaller than normal and therefore has increased pressure. And if there's increased pressure as this child is developing, that sensibly could lead to these muscle contractures uh, and underdevelopment of the limbs as well. Finally, amniotic band syndrome. So in amniotic band syndrome, the idea is that there is entrapment of the limb uh, or of a digit, uh, and usually it is one of the limbs or digits as opposed to the rest of the body, by a thick band of amniotic membrane. Um, you can see uh, here's a diagram essentially of a fetus developing in utero, and in particular you're looking at some of the structures of the placenta and of the, uh, of the amnion itself. The placenta is made up essentially of a large number of blood vessels that are going to allow the developing baby's blood to get right up next to mom's blood. There's not actual mixing there. There's no true mixing of bloods, but they get right next to each other so they can exchange food, oxygen, water, waste products, and so that mom would be able to again ingest food and be able to pass those nutrients to her child or absorb uh, waste products from the child and be able to excrete them uh, on her own, excrete them on uh, behalf of the child, so to speak. In terms of the linings, uh, we have the amnion and the chorion. The amnion is the innermost lining uh, as the child is developing. It does produce the amniotic fluid. The chorion is a bit outside that. Uh, it's a little bit thicker of a membrane. It also helps with anchoring uh, to the mother's placenta, uh, sorry, to the mother's uterus via that placenta. In amniotic band syndrome, some of the amnion may have come disconnected. We may have a band then that is able to wrap around uh, the arm or the digit of this developing child as they move around in the uterus. So this causes disruption at that particular site. It can cause swelling distal to the site. And the reason for that is mainly because the uh, blood and the lymphatic fluids that are trying to drain from that distal uh, portion of the, uh, of the finger or of the uh, limb aren't able to do so. And so if we have this pooling of blood and pooling of lymphatic fluid, it causes that swelling. And uh, quite frankly, if it's tight enough, as you see here, it can also cause amputation uh, of that particular limb or digit in utero. 
Uh, and here you see another example in amniotic band syndrome where here uh, there are some other limb uh, malformations that you see or other limb deformations possibly caused by amniotic band syndrome. But the one in particular to focus on is the one on the right here. You can see that tightening again caused by a band that was presumably wrapped around this second digit. So that's it. Uh, congratulations on completing uh, going out on a limb, the anatomy of the upper limb. My name again is Dr. Alexander Macnow, and on behalf of both myself and Dr. Jim White, we want to thank you for taking this course. Good luck, and hopefully we'll see you for another one.